Welcome to LSE IQ. I'm Jess Winterstein, and this is the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. This month, as holidays draw to a close and new school and university years begin, we're bringing you a bite-sized episode. This is a public school program. I will never, ever cut a player who comes out to play for me. But when you put that uniform on, that Titan uniform, you better come to work. We will be perfect in every aspect of the game. You drop a pass, you run a mile. You miss a blocking assignment, you run a mile. You fumble the football, and I will break my foot off in your John Brown hind parts. And then you will run a mile. Perfection. Let's go to work. Um, So because I think that a lot of perfectionists, including myself, we use that word because we pretend it's a fault. You know, you actually secretly think it's a virtue. And so the trick is to actually expose it, to pull off its fake mask, and to expose perfectionism by, and call it by its real name, which is fear. Um, that's all it is, it's fear. It's fear that you're not good enough. It's fear that you're gonna be revealed, uncovered, exposed. And so you're trying to mask that absolute terror by never making a misstep. That was actor Denzel Washington in the film Remember the Titans, demanding his team push themselves as far as possible to achieve their very best. And author Elizabeth Gilbert explaining why she took the view in her book, Big Magic, that perfection is something we should try to let go of. Two very different views on an issue that, for some, can have a debilitating impact. A 2016 review published in the Journal of Clinical Psychology, found that high levels of perfectionism could be linked to depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-harm, and obsessive-compulsive disorder. While there is no doubt that being praised as perfect is an extremely high accolade in today's world, does striving for perfection lead us to achieve the best we can, or might it drive us to a more destructive place? In this episode of LSEIQ, I spoke to Dr. Thomas Curran, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychological and Behavioural Science at LSE. Dr. Curran has studied the impact of perfectionism in adolescents, college students and beyond. I spoke to him via Microsoft Teams and asked him, is perfect the enemy of the possible? On the surface, being a perfectionist sounds like um, quite a positive attribute to have. Why does it merit sort of specific attention? Well, perfectionism is a a personality trait. And you're right, it's something that is, I guess, everyone's favourite flaw would be the best way of describing it. A lot of people will hold up perfectionism as something that is positive. We know the collateral sort of heaps of hard work and excessive self-imposed pressure, but I think that's kind of the point, this idea that hard work and uh, and maximising opportunities and being seen to be somebody who's industrious is kind of a, important sources of worth. But I think it's important at the outset to kind of differentiate between perfectionism in, in the sense of what it outputs as to say the work ethic and the high self-imposed pressure and actually the internal experience uh, what it looks like on a day-to-day basis for individuals and it becomes slightly more negative when we when we view it from that angle uh, perfectionism isn't really about perfecting things or tasks like i guess a master craftsman or a you know skilled surgeon um, would approach their profession it's more about the internal experience and perfecting the self i guess more precisely trying to repair or in some way overcome what is what is seen as a flawed or defective self and and so when we view it from that angle perfectionism becomes much more negative uh, because essentially uh, we're trying every single day to convince other people that we're not flawed that we're not defective and that we are worth something uh, in this culture While pushing ourselves to do our very best might lead to some internal pain, might it not also lead us to accomplish more than we might have without that internal drive to do the very best we can? So one of the things that's often said about about perfectionism is is that, well, okay, we we know it has these damaging psychological effects and we know people get very stressed out and anxious. But but on the flip side, of course, they're they're high achievers, right? We know perfectionists in in our own lives. We see them as high achievers. 
and therefore it must mean that perfectionism is the reason that they've, they've achieved. And one of the interesting things about perfectionism is that we don't see that borne out in the data. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is that perfectionists kind of go above and beyond when it comes to effort. So they, they go right to the limit and then more. And what they do in that uh, effort is they compromise other areas of their life, like health, uh, sleep, diet, time with friends, etc., which can help switch off, recharge, um, and, and mean that we perform better in our day-to-day -day life. But the other reason is that perfectionism is kind of a paradox. So you have this, you have this kind of situation whereby perfectionists approach tasks and activities with so much effort, so much effort, you know, everything that they have that put into it. But if you tell them that they failed or you give them some poor feedback and then you tell them to do the task again, what you see is their effort completely drop off a cliff. And the reason is because they put so much effort in and they haven't succeeded, but the embarrassment and the shame that they feel from not succeeding is so strong that they'll do everything they can to avoid feeling those thoughts again, those emotions again. So in order to save face, they withdraw effort on a second attempt because you can't really fail at something that you didn't try at. So it's a really interesting relationship to infections and performance. And whenever I hear people, people say, well, you know, it's worth it because of the performance uh, that comes from perfectionism, the data is not strong. On, on the relationship between the two. There is no relationship, and if there is, it's really small. So I would argue it's not worth it. I spoke to Dr. Cohen as LSE and other universities, alongside secondary and primary schools, were gearing up for the start of the academic year. In an attempt to understand if perfectionism was rising, Dr. Cohen has studied students in the US, Canada, and the UK. I asked him to explain more. I was kind of really preoccupied five or six years ago with the idea that, that I was studying perfectionism and that every time I talked to people about perfectionism, they would kind of tell me that they are a bit of a perfectionist. And so it's, it was a, it was certainly something that was in the water and a lot of people, res it resonated with a lot of people. And I was really interested to know, well, we might be, we might be observing a, a trend, an uptick in, in, in endorsement of perfectionist tendencies, but is that really happening? So I basically collated all the information that had been collected on perfectionism across a 26, 27 year period, um, focused on college students because college students are the same age so that we so essentially we can treat them as separate birth cohorts and then string them out over time to see if things are changing. Levels of college student reports of uh, perfectionism are changing. And, and that's exactly what we what we did. And, and we saw that there was an increase in perfectionism, much uh, higher levels of self-imposed goals and standards. Uh, and what was really interesting is also we saw a lot, uh, an increase in perceptions of external pressure to be perfect and pressure from the external environment and close others. Um, to be perfect and, and that was the element that had, had, had risen the most um, and that's the element that we're most concerned about because those social expectations of perfection have particularly damaging impacts on our mental health. Is there something about our learning environments specifically that you think might be leading to this increase in perfectionism amongst students or do you think it's it is a wider societal pressure or I mean perhaps does it come down to parenting and really early years uh, experiences? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to unpack in that question. And the short answer is that there, um, it's a cultural phenomenon, uh, t to my mind. Uh, shifts in culture have occurred over the last 50 years that have culminated where we are today in, in a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure, unprecedented pressure on young people, it has to be said, uh, particularly in schools and college. Uh, standardized testing is something that's particularly in the US really accelerated in recent years, but that, that's also the case in the UK too. And competition for college has become much more fierce. It becomes much more important for young people and their families to ensure that they get into the best colleges, which ensures that they have the highest of market prices. And, and everything is bound up in um, economic reasoning. And, and, and young people know that. They understand that quite acutely. That if they don't try and they don't work, then they can severely damage their life chances. Hello. Tell me about it. Of course, the first relationship a child has is with a parent. Dr. Curran's research found that children exposed to a parenting style that featured guilt inducement and love withdrawal 
might develop self-critical perfectionism and narcissistic perfectionist tendencies. I asked him about this. I imagine most of the parents don't deliberately aim to do that to their children. I mean, I think the person would say you're absolutely right. This, this isn't a uh, this isn't something that parents uh, want to do. Uh, I, I strongly believe that. Uh, I don't think this is anything they really have any control over. When you when you look out into the world, a lot of concern and uncertainty about young people's futures, and parents feel that. And it's completely natural and it's completely understandable that they might respond with high expectations, high levels of criticism. These are things that we're seeing in the data. But all there are ways in which you can you can combat uh, the, the or at least resist the urge to engage in some of those practices. I think I think for me and and and, and a lot of other social psychologists, we would definitely advocate uh, a focus on learning and growth um, and development over outcome. Essentially, if we get too fixated on the metric and the ultimate result, what we tend to lose along the way is, a folk, you know, that kind of implicit joy of learning and developing just on its own in terms of its its intrinsic value. Um, but I'd also say there are other things that we can do as parents, particularly when the pressure's on. Um, try to just teach kids that it's okay to fail. It's not a catastrophic. It, it's a learning opportunity. It's a way that builds our resilience and allows us to meet and face new challenges um, with, a, with a, a sense of perspective that we might not have had before. Given the potentially serious kind of mental health impact that this can have on an individual, do you think it's taken as seriously as it should be? I don't think it's taken as seriously as it perhaps should be. And I think the reason for that is that we live in a culture that celebrates perfection is something that's sort of an emblem of, of strength and it isn't just young people that do this it's across the board policymakers sports sports stars uh, journalists you know you try and imagine somebody in a position of power that doesn't at some level celebrate this idea that kind of merit excellence and all the rest of it is important to success you know this kind of personal responsibility and ownership over our destiny is is crucial to success there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is something that's not going to go away quickly this is something that's ingrained and it, it in, and basically a fundamental axiom of modern society that you know uh, if you don't succeed that's your fault and if you do you get uh, all manner of rewards statuses etc etc but it very much feeds into at a psychological level people's celebration of perfection and so it is a problem but it's not a problem at the moment that I think we're ready to tackle until we understand the ramifications and the psychological ramifications of, of this uh, particular psyche. Um, and we're trying as hard as we can to collate the data because when you actually study it, when you actually understand it and look at how it works, you can begin to see that it creates all manner of psychological conflicts, neurotic conflicts, and, and mental health problems that ultimately mean. Um, it's, it's, it's net negative for society. The coronavirus has just impacted everything, especially students who have been out of school. I can imagine this is ratcheting up the pressure in one sense, but is it in another sense perhaps a way to maybe allow people to take a break, to reset? I think that's true. And, and there was some data that came out yesterday, I think, to suggest that anxiety in, in certain young people it is down. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because the schooling system has been kind of removed from their lives and, and the anxiety that comes with it has, has, has fallen. So I think there is some, some room to be optimistic about some maybe fundamental shifts in, in what we focus on as we, as we come out of the coronavirus. But, but I would also suggest that we need, just need to be very careful about, about how that's managed because one of the things that concerns me in particular is the news segments about people who have you know, been made redundant or fallen on hard times as a consequence of, of the coronavirus. One of the key threads through those interviews is shame. I kind of sense that there's some sort of pride in 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 not be, not being someone that has uh, that has fallen on on hard times and, and being seen to pull ourselves up and out of it. But of course, this is something no, no one can control. This is nobody's fault. But 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 the way that society is structured, it makes it feel like it is. So, is perfect the enemy of the possible? I would say perfectionism, by definition, is an impossible goal. No one's perfect. And I would, I would ask you to think about whether even you would want to be perfect. 
the, the, the problem with, with, with trying to be perfect is that there's just too pristine. Uh, there's the clean edges and the, and the kind of uh, filtered facade in that we kind of we kind of project out into the world to try to, to try to try to curate a sense of perfection robs us uh, in many ways of, of character and color and the 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 kind of jagged edges I suppose that make us who we are and so I think it's really time that we started to celebrate those imperfections actually they 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 bring life they 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 bring excitement um and they bring character uh to the table and so perfect is not a possible goal and even if it was why would you want to be to be perfect uh, celebrate the flaws celebrate the imperfections because they are what makes us us and and try not to worry about what other people think other people's validation is is great and feedback is important but it shouldn't define our sense of self-worth or self-esteem tell us what you think using the hashtag lseiq this episode of lseiq was produced by ollie johnson and myself jess winterstein want to explore the issue of perfectionism in more depth this episode was based in part on the following research a test of social learning and parent socialization perspectives on the development of perfectionism by Thomas Curran, Daniel J. Madigan, Andrew P. Hill and Annette Victoria Sterners and Perfectionism is Increasing Over Time, a meta-analysis of birth cohort differences from 1989 to 2016 by Thomas Curran and Andrew P. Hill. For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.